Hej och varmt välkomna till årets första internationell författarscen. Per Bergström heter jag och är producent för internationell författarscen här i Malmö. Som ikväll har besök från Los Angeles då vi gästas av Ryan Gettis. Ryan Gettis som i höstas introducerades på svenska med sin tredje roman Sex dagar om upploppen i Los Angeles 1992. Översatt av Niklas Wahl, utgiven på Albert Bonniers förlag. När jag började läsa så kunde jag från första sidan verkligen inte lägga ifrån när jag söks in i den här boken. För jag tycker det är ett strålande exempel på hur fiktionen kan förklara historien. Jag är genant okunnig om vad som hände i april 1992 i Los Angeles. Men Gertes lyckas i en bild av staden och händelserna genom röster- en samling röster av polis, gängmedlemmar, butiksinnehavare, graffitikonstnärer som skapar liksom en gemensam bild. Och eh, en bild som påverkade mig oerhört starkt. Det är en korta tid man får vistas tillsammans med de här karaktärerna. I kväll kommer Gertis att samtala med Andres Locko. Och vi kommer att få höra... Jenny Jensson från teatergruppen Potato Potato läsa ur Niklas Wahls översättning. Med det sagt, welcome to Malmö, welcome up on stage, Ryan Gertis and Andres Locko. <laughs> okay, now I just happened to... We had, a, we had a long discussion about where to, how to sit and which side is the best one. And we might have failed. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, just one thing in Swedish. Jenny, ska du börja med att läsa en liten bit ur boken? För jag tror inte alla, alla kanske inte har läst. Jag kör på ångorna när jag kommer till hörnet av Sixth Street och Western. Och det hade inte behövt bli så om jag inte hade tvingats köra runt en massa armésnubbar. Sticka österut på 76th Street ett tag bort i Hoover. Sen in på Gage tills jag kunde smyga ut på Western igen och fortsätta norrut. Vilken omväg. Det var inget jag hade planerat. Och nu har jag bara en låda kvar när jag ser ett köpcentrum på 6th Street och tänker skitsamma, varför inte? Det här stället duger väl lika bra som något annat i mitt mästerverk. För jag tänker bränna ner hela jävla skiten. Båda våningarna och allt. Men det är lite knäppt, för jag kan inte koncentrera mig så bra. Olika smaker har nämligen hoppat runt i munnen i flera kvarter. Typ ena sekunden är det jordnötssmör. Och jag tänker, när helvete käkar jag jordnötssmör sist? Jag gillar det inte ens. Jag måste ha varit, vadå, 15. Och sen när jag känner mig säker på att jag inte äter det sedan jag var 14 så smakar jag tomat i munnen. Färsk tomat. Och jag känner lukten av det också. Fy fan. Jag har tagit alldeles för mycket kol alltså. Jag försöker få bort tomatsmaken ur skallen genom att plocka åt mig fälgkorset som har halkat omkring där bak sedan jag satte mig bakom ratten på den här rishögen. Och så går jag ut och slår in några skyltfönster. När de gjorde det tände jag på en romflaska och kastade in den. Jag har klarat av ett par stycken när jag upptäcker ett gäng chicanos på andra sidan gatan. Eller ja, det är svårt att se på långt håll. De kan vara svarta också. Hur som helst är de helt galna och gör sitt bästa för att svita loss järngallret från fönstret på en närbutik. De går till och med så långt att de fäster någon slags rep i dragkroken på en sönderrostad pickup och försöker rycka loss ser jag i hela jävla skiten. Och sen förstår jag varför. Det är någon kvar där inne som de försöker komma åt. En butiksägare med ett gevär eller något. För det skriks och gapas och folk hoppar in och ut genom öppningen och knäpper av skott som om vi var i Beirut eller något. Det får mig att skynda på lite. Jag slår in ett tredje fönster och ett fjärde. Jag tar bara de mörka skyltfönstren. De upplysta kan skita på sig. Jag vill inte ha någon snubbe som väntar med en bössa där inne. Jag är inne på min femte. En videobutik med planscher som jag inte kan läsa för orden är skrivna med ett annat alfabet. När jag hör ett tjut bakom mig. 
Som en bil som nitar så gummit ryker eller något. Och först är jag säker på att det är pickuppen. Men sen är det någon som ropar något i stil med Vi skjuter, vi skjuter! Men jag vänder mig inte om. Jag pajar ett fönster till. Tänker att det är nog typ puckorna på andra sidan gatan. Men när jag skickar in en flammande flaska rom genom rutan hör jag Stå still, annars skjuter jag jättehögt och på engelska. Och kanske är det till mig han säger det. Om det är det, tänker jag, kan han skita på sig. Jag tar upp fällkorset igen och tänker slå in ett fönster till. Men jag hör en knall innan jag hinner dra till glaset. Och det ringer i öronen, det, det bara börjar helt plötsligt. Och nu syns det ett hål i glaset, ett riktigt litet hål. Som om någon precis har kastat in en spelkula. Jag hostar och det kommer blod på glaset framför mig. Som ett sprutmönster ungefär. Då fattar jag med en gång att det är mitt. Jag bara fitta. Och det viskar jag och sträcker fram en hand och rör vid, vid, vid det på glaset. Det ser sjukt mycket mörkare ut än hur blod ska se ut. Och jag försöker stoppa tillbaka det. Alltså jag försöker verkligen. Det är stupid, va? Jag försöker torka upp mitt blod från glaset och stoppa in det i mig igen- men när jag rör vid insidan av kinden så märker jag att det är hål i den. Ett hål som är lika stort som fingertoppen. Det vet jag för jag känner efter. Och jag försöker täppa till det. Men när jag försöker så åker fingret helt igenom till andra sidan. Och jag känner polisongen på kinden. På utsidan av kinden. Och då fattar jag att jag nästan rör vid örat. Medan halva handen är inuti munnen. Fitta. Det var inte bra. Jag började tappa känslan i huvudet, typ i skallen. Jag känner ingenting. Inte nu längre. Och det känns knasigt för jag har ingen huvudvärk. Det är bara ingenting där. Bara ett mörker som kommer upp i golvet. Tar tag i mig som om det hade händer. Mm. Tack. It's a tricky language, isn't it? <laughs> has a rhythm. That's good. It's quite important for the novel. I think so. That's why the translation actually works, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but, be, no, not before we start, but, but as a beginning, it would be great if, um, because the book is called All Involved mm. in English. Yes. But the Swedish title is, as you'd probably understood, Six Days. Yes. And without explaining exactly what the novel is about, but what, what actually, in 1992, during these riots, what actually did happen during those six days? Why did you choose these particular six days? You know, I think I chose those six days in particular because uh, the thing that stood out to me, the more I learned about it, is that it... For six days, Los Angeles essentially became the Wild West. Yeah. Police were everywhere else. You know, emergency situations were dragging them to Florence and Normandy, were dragging them north, were dragging them to Beverly Hills. And these wide swaths of the city uh, that were already ignored mm -hmm. were completely open. And I think initially, when I, when I thought about writing this book, And, and attempting to do it justice, I thought, well, it's, it's really a noir western. That it's ultimately, you know, you have a group of characters who want to take justice into their own hands and have the opportunity to do so because of the chaos of those six days. Why did you want to write this book? I mean, <laughs> it's quite a task. Yeah, uh, you know, I think it for started... A, for a white dude and all yeah, that. Yeah, no, hey, fair enough. <laughs> uh, it, it started with, you know, being in Los Angeles at a really difficult time in my life. I thought for certain I was done being a writer. You know, my career seemed to, for all intents and purposes, be completely over. Uh, hadn't sold a book in eight years. Ouch. Yeah, more than ouch. <laughs> like, starving. <laughs> Literally. Uh, so I moved to this tiny rent-controlled flat 
two blocks from Skid Row. And please explain Skid Row. Because <laughs> okay. I vaguely know what it is, sure. but not everyone does. Yeah, absolutely. To understand Skid Row, you have to consider the California weather. Close your eyes for just a moment and think about all that sun and palm trees. And that affords the opportunity to sleep out. So a very large homeless population congregates in the downtown area, which is Skid Row. Mm. It started actually uh, in the 40s and 50s, uh, mainly because it was an area of very cheap hotels and it was very near to the produce markets and the fish markets. Mm. And you had workers who would work seasonally and they would come in and they would work for two weeks, three months, whatever. And then they would get on the trains and maybe they'd go up to Stockton and pick strawberries. You know, there was very much an itinerant workforce for a very long time. Um, what has created kind of a modern hell in Skid Row was those hotels being knocked down or being declared uh, substandard housing and crack and heroin coming in mm -hmm. and basically turning what was essentially an itinerant you know, um, area with plenty of bars and plenty of ridiculousness into actually a very scary area with high crime and a permanent homeless population. And that's, that's really what Skid Row is now. And I live two blocks from that. Mm. You know, I could see that every day. I could see it, you know, in a way I could see where I'd end up if, if things didn't get better, didn't improve. Yeah, I, my apartment was 200 square feet. Yeah. A hot plate, half a closet. It was not great, um, but I think what, what really pushed me to write the book, and I know you've, <laughs> you're hitting me on that and you deserve to, um, it was actually being forced to explore the city. You know, I, w I was actually invited to become a member of a street art crew in Los Angeles, UGLAR, U-G-L-A-R, which stands for Unified Group of Los Angeles Residents. How did that come about? You know, Why it, did they ask some you? just quirk of coincidence, really. You know, someone I went to university with yeah. knew one of the members, and she had said, look, I know you really well. I know him really well. I've heard you both talk. You would love each other. And, you know, she introduced us one day, and it was as if she wasn't even in the room. Like, all we did was talk about really? tacos yeah. and Los Angeles Ooh, tacos. and samurai. And, you know, it was, <laughs> it was out of control. Uh, yeah, but, and from that day, he just introduced me to a few more folks. And, you know, the more time we spent together, I think the more we realized that we were of like minds and like tastes. And uh, what is Aguilar? I was going to say, uh, it was one of my questions. Okay. I was going to say U-G-L-A-R, but Aguilar. Aguilar, yeah, why not? And what do they do? What do we oh, do? Oh, you. Yeah. Sorry. You yeah. Know, we, we paint murals in Los yeah. Angeles primarily, but we're also you know, an art collective. All the guys work on paintings on their own time, and we've done shows. We've done museum shows. Uh, we recently did a mural in Paris. And you paint as well? A little bit. A little bit. I think a big part of, of what I try to do in the group is find new ways to tell stories, yeah. whether on walls or you know, whether bringing new stories onto the page. Like, so, for example... You know, uh, if I hadn't spoken to as many former graffiti writers, I, mm. I really would have had no idea how to write freer section in the book. And I, I still, to this day, am hearing, you know, it's going around the grapevine. Wait a second. What? This guy knows too much. Like, was he, was he painting back, you know, back in the day? Who is he? What was his tag name? And, you know, it just so happened that... And whatever you answer, it, it gives you quite a good credibility. <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> I was just straight up. You Did know. you need that? I mean, to write the book, because you, you, I get the impression, having read a couple of interviews with you mm. and, and obviously read the book, that, that it's, you know, half journalism, half fiction, uh, if you know what I mean. Sure. Uh, you know, and I think some interviews are happy to put their own spin on things, yeah. but it's completely fiction. However, mm. to answer your earlier question, you know, it's... It's but as it integrity. says in the film, it's based on a true story. Well, it's or based on the riots, yeah, uh, you yeah, know, which exactly. absolutely happened. Yeah. You know, a number of uh, uh, buildings that I mention in the book burned down. They absolutely burned down in mm. real life. And, and in particular, there's a section in Koreatown where uh, it, there's a very well-known story of Koreans and Korean Americans being arrested by the LAPD for illegal gun possession as they were trying to put out a fire. 
the greater danger was clearly putting out the fire. They didn't yeah. know if anyone was in there, and yet the LAPD arrested them anyway. Uh, as far as and you, credibility... Would you say oh. that it, that was like racist thingy or... I, it was miscommunication stupidity. at the worst. Yeah. Uh, at, excuse me, at best it was miscommunication. Yeah. At worst it was racism. Mm. Uh, it's hard to know unless we were actually there. Yeah. As far as you know, cre credibility, I think that you always need that. That's always important. Mm. You know, but it certainly helped that I was a member of Uglar because they, you know, they've painted in the city for 15 years, almost 20. And What's the background of the other guys? And they they I'm, come I'm from some of the, the toughest neighborhoods in LA. Yeah. You know, they know it. They lived yeah. it. Uh, so it, it helped that they trusted me to be part of the group. You know, that was a pass of sorts that mm. enabled people to speak to me, especially yeah. former Latino gang members. And I mean, that was, that was the big one. Uh, it's always the question, and you've already alluded to it, you know, how do you, you know, a white guy from Colorado, you didn't grow up in a, like, why did people even bother speaking to you? You know, I think the truth of it is I, I went in there with respect. Mm. I listened. And I also made it very clear to them, look, you know, I'm, I'm a survivor of violence. I'm not a tourist. I'm not here to uh, just make things up and, and disappear. You know, I'm here to listen and try to find the heart and the soul of the era. And that includes music. It includes how people dressed. It includes what fires smelled like. 11,000 yeah. fires in the city. What did that smell like? That's quite bonkers. That's It's lot. insane. It's insane. <laughs> I think one of the saddest stories I heard, and it wasn't, it wasn't so much a story as a feeling, was a firefighter telling me what it was like to stand on uh, the corner of Western yeah. and see eight fires in his field of vision. Warehouse, house, large building, and be told you can only save one. And his captain had to decide which one that was. And in the meantime, you have citizens from all around the neighborhood screaming at you, save mine. Yeah. Save this instead. I mean, I, I, it was mind-blowing just, just to sit down with these folks. And then it, it was just this incredible, you know, fertile inspiration to be able to say, wow, okay, how do I go after a feeling? Mm. You know, I was, I was not interested in telling anyone's story. I think specifically because it, it wouldn't have been safe for me to do that, you know, within the Latino gang community. It just wouldn't. Uh, the whole reason people spoke to me in the first place is because I said, I write fiction. You know, I'm not, I don't want to write your story. I need that freedom to find a connection here and a connection there and a connection there and weave things together. Like, that's what excites me as a writer. It doesn't, you know, I, I wasn't trying to disrespect anyone, but it doesn't excite me to write someone's life story. It just doesn't. It's quite a big difference. I mean, to, th th there's loads of people who wouldn't trust the media, mm. but literature is not part of the media. Sure. Literature is so art. It's, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's art. exactly. And it helped that I worked with artists. It helped that at the time I was a college professor. Yeah. Like that, that really blew me yeah. away. You know, there's the, in the United States in this, this day and age, I think there's an awful lot of disrespect for educators, an awful mm. lot, uh, but not in poor communities. In poor communities... I was, in many cases, the first professor they'd ever met. And there was a very real respect there. And, and that was amazing. That blew me away. That is amazing. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I need to go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> uh, there's also a, one, one thing that... Um, the, the part that uh, Jenny read as well... Mm. is. Uh, one of my favorite things with the book is, um, which I can really relate to as well, is uh, how we never get away from popular culture, from pop culture. Sure. Uh, even when people, whether they want to or not, have to kill someone or whack someone, uh, when it actually happens, they are reminded of scenes from films or music, yeah. and even when someone is dying, yeah. they're still like, wow, this reminds me of a film I saw, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably quite true. It, it was quite true, at least as far as... Uh, and and I, I find that amazing, because, because I've 
I mean, obviously, you know, pop, pop culture, uh, we all know it's there, mm. but um, here it's there in a very violent way quite sure. often. And we still go, wait a minute, this reminds me of Star Wars. <laughs> sure. Well, it suffuses modern life. I, d I don't know that there's any way to have you know, a full life in, in, in this day and age without the layers you know, mm. of, of pop culture. In some cases, they're impenetrable. In other cases, I think they, they penetrate us and they change how we see the world. And I think that's great art in general has the opportunity to change how we see the world. And honestly, you know, I've, I've sat down with, with people yeah. who've done very bad things and listened to, you know, what did it feel like for you to do that? You know, what, what did it remind you of? What, you know, and just hearing that there was a connection, you know, between a number of people who didn't know each other, that there, you know, if they were seeing something terrible for the first time, the instant first leap was to pop culture, or I saw that in a, I saw that in a movie, but, but it feels different because I'm in it and I'm experiencing <laughs> yeah. it. And of course that would be the case, but you know, there's no other frame of reference except the image in that case. Because I took it, I mean, when I read the book, uh, I was like, yeah. Mm. But when I went back and also, you know, before this, I, I went through favorite passages and I was like, huh. there's a lot of television and films sure. and music in here that but that's I LA just took too. it for granted when I read it sure. the first time around because I, I'm probably exactly the same in most of art. Wow. I mean, I, it was, I think it's impossible to write an LA story without weaving that in as well because in so many ways Los Angeles is responsible for how we view so much of pop culture whether in cinema or television. So I don't know. Do you feel like you have to defend Los Angeles? Oh, I frequently feel like I have to defend Los Angeles. <laughs> but, but I will say, I, I do so not, it, not in the way that I'm defending it as people currently know it. Yeah. I think I'm defending it in a way of simply saying, look, there are hidden places mm. here that even Angelinos don't know or are afraid to go to. And these are valuable places mm. with valuable humans who go through difficult things. And it's, they're great stories, sure. But it tells a broader, broader, broader by far story of Los Angeles than simply Santa Monica, Beverly Hills, rich people sipping champagne or Hollywood. Yeah. There's a lot more going on in the city. And, and all I'm trying to do is let people know it's bigger than you think. I th yeah. I, th I think, I mean, the cliche as, as a European mm. would probably be, yeah, it's Beverly Hills <laughs> and it's drive-bys yeah. and <laughs> gangster hip-hop in wow. Compton or something. Okay. I'm exaggerating here. I know, I know, but, I know. Uh, <laughs> I'm not offended, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but also, the, the, I mean, one of the great books, one of the great things about the book is, is, and why it really works today, is that it could be about yesterday or tomorrow, mm. I think. Absolutely. Uh, and do you reckon... Anything or nothing has changed since 1992. I mean, we have the election in the sure. US coming up as well, I which is quite odd. As I mean, let's we, please, I mean, please we, not we, talk about that. Oh, no, no, no. Let's, Tonight we'll be here. We, we we'll don't, be we, here all I night. know. We, we don't have to get into the election <laughs> part enough. of it. Fair but enough. has anything changed? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think things have changed very dramatically in Los Angeles County. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the thing that's so fascinating is that w in many ways what led to the riots was a balkanization of Los Angeles. You know, you had so many different facets, so many different immigrant groups, whether it was the Koreans and Korean Americans. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had, you had African Americans. I mean, as I describe in the book, Latinos unto themselves are an incredibly multifaceted, multicultural, multi-ethnic group. You know, there's people from El Salvador, mm -hmm. from, they could be from Chile, they could be from Mexico, they could be from a certain region of Mexico and not get along with other people from a different region of Mexico. I mean, it's, it's an unbelievably amazing amount of diversity. Yeah. And pre-92, because of this balkanization, you had this insularity. You had these groups keeping to themselves, shopping only in their neighborhoods, not speaking to others, being afraid of the outside world. 92 explodes, and it, not, it didn't just explode those notions, it exploded the city, literally. And 
what are you left with? Well, you're left with an awful lot of folks who realize uh, we need to talk to each other. We genuinely need to have communication here. It doesn't mean I need to agree with you, mm -hmm. but we have to talk. And, and that was massive. I think that was an honestly massive shift. And what that has created is, is this really wonderful cultural through line that is occurring in Los Angeles now. I think we are only just now realizing the legacy of the riots. I really believe this. You know, and, and, it, and it's mainly one of hybridization. So, for example, I mean, we were talking about food trucks earlier today. <laughs> yeah. Well, that started in Los Angeles. Mm. And it was started by a Korean-American in Los Angeles, a man named Roy Choi, who basically fused Korean food with Mexican food and created this incredibly unique American dish. He put it in a, in a truck called Kogi, and he drove it all over. People loved it. It exploded from there, and all of a sudden, people saw the viability of that business model. Does he have the patent for the food truck? <laughs> you know, it would be great, but yeah. he, no, he doesn't. I think he's more uh, just excited to see the yeah. movement and, and to see things changing, and I think that's really emblematic of the Los Angeles that we have now, mm -hmm. and you know, to delve back into the pop cultural argument, you know, you have a band like Linkin Park, mm -hmm. who, you know... It, we could discuss the merits of, of their musicianship, oh, yeah. but here's the thing. You know, you had kids who grew up with hip hop as the primary mm -hmm. driving force in their lives, but they also love rock music, and so they found a way to fuse it. I think this, it, it's, it continues, the, this idea of fusion and hybridization is very Angelino because it's so diverse. It's yeah. really the most diverse city in America, and I think that, that's one of the most wonderful, wonderful legacies of the riot is that none of that happens without communication. But also the book came out when the whole Black Lives Matter mm. uh, demos all around the US and even in yeah. Europe uh, yeah. started yeah. again, I'd yeah. say. Uh, and so it has, has such a resonance yeah. to, on the other hand, like sure. to, to 2016. Well... You know, I just spoke about the nice ways yeah. Los Angeles has I changed, know. but and there are also brilliant. fundamentally yeah. broken mm. ways that it hasn't changed. And I think we're starting to see that pattern out all over the United States. It doesn't matter if it's in Missouri mm. or North Carolina or in New York or Baltimore. Mm. We're starting to see similar patterns of not just criminal policing, but police failing to be punished, which was ultimately what created the riots yeah. in the first place. And it's what created riots in Ferguson, and it's what may very Because well we create go, if riots we go in Baltimore. Back, I mean, the, the reason most people see why the riots started in '92 mm. was uh, Rodney King was badly, badly beaten up by the police on video. Yes, on video. Yeah, that was that was why. Uh, that was the reason we yeah. were given as why. It, of course, ignoring a tremendous amount of context. Context being. That, it, that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. Mm. There was a case that happened about a year before that where a Korean shop owner shot a 15-year-old girl in the back and killed her. Latasha Harlan's an African-American yeah. girl. That left a serious scar on the African-American community when there was no justice as they saw it because this shop owner was given a $500 fine and community service for killing a young girl. When Rodney King happens, all, all the other neighborhoods of Los Angeles, and I don't just mean Watts, I don't just mean Compton, I don't just mean Linwood, which is the central neighborhood yeah. city in my, in my book, I found, as I spoke to people from all over, I kept hearing, oh, every neighborhood has a Rodney King. Now mm -hmm. we can all see it. Black or brown, every neighborhood has a Rodney King, but now we have proof. Yeah. But again, it's just the straw that broke the camel's back. That, you know, that doesn't just happen based on one video clip. It happens based on a series of incidents that nobody knows about unless you're black or brown in a given community until it's too late. And then it blows up. I mean, with, with uh, what's happening politically in Europe mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, I mean, the, the, every, every neighborhood has its own Rodney King would probably be be true of most of Sweden mm. as well How so? uh, these days. How so? And because, well, the, the, the rise of the extreme right mm. in Europe. And um, I think that could be a valid poster mm. in, in most parts, well, in most cities. 
not only in Sweden, but mostly Western Europe these okay. days. Which is awfully sad, but mm. true, I think. Okay. Uh, and that's, I think, I mean, the riots in LA in '92, but then you had, um, then you had London, yeah. and 2011, uh, 2010, ten, okay. I think, uh, and. Uh, Sweden is a smaller place, but there's been loads of riots here as well. Mm. And, I mean, pretty much all over the world. Sure. So, uh, Well, riots are a form of communication, too. Yeah. Just not necessarily a socially acceptable one. Mm. But they're still telling us something. They're still telling us something's wrong, broken, and people are hurting. But what do we do about it? <laughs> All right. I'm a big writer. Question. Big question. Sorry, I mate. I get to ask questions. I'm not. <laughs> Sorry, mate. You know, I mean, I'm happy to weigh in, but you know, I think it's ultimately up to to the people and the politicians and and also business owners to a certain extent. I mean, that's it's it's been a huge issue even now in South Central that education isn't where it needs to be. Mm. Um, Healthcare isn't where it needs to be. After school programs are non-existent. The arts are getting cut in the most vulnerable neighborhoods in LA. Yeah. And there simply aren't enough jobs. And unfortunately, that, that leads me to the conclusion that, you know, that the tender's there mm. for another spark, you know, unless some very real measures are made to actually address those foundational issues. And look. Donald Trump's the guy to do it, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, Donald, Donald Trump. Trump's the guy to do it, right? No. <laughs> no, he's no, really sorry, not. Sorry, I, sh I shouldn't bring up the yeah, election. You said you right. wouldn't. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm awfully sorry. You said you wouldn't. <laughs> I'm sorry. But when I think back to, to when I first read All Involved, mm. I, I don't know why, but I very much think of it as a hip-hop book. Huh, okay. Uh, and I mean that in a very good way. But okay. I, don't know, I don't know exactly why. You don't know why. No, I just I think of it as I mean it's an in it's based in a lane. Hmm. It's sort of very musical. It's got the attention to detail. Okay. Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's me being Swedish and it's the kind of exoticism. Okay. As well. Sure. And when I think of music in LA, I very much think about hip hop. Sure. Probably. Well, I think one of the reasons why LA hip hop resonates. Yeah. Is that. Uh, it definitely comes from a place of pain. Mm. I think a lot of great art comes yeah. from a place of pain. Uh, but I think it's also to do with uh, certainly attention to detail, but also a, a willingness to, to be as authentic as, as humanly possible. I think that's always been a tremendous undercurrent within hip-hop. It doesn't matter if it's from New York or Atlanta no. or Kansas City or L.A. It, it's always about proclaiming who you are and, and shouting it even if there's that, you know, you have to mask and hide that worry that no one will care. Yeah. But you're still, you need a voice and you're going to say it. And I think, you know, I think that's a really a kind of a beautiful and, and wonderful way of looking at the book that, you know, here, here are some folks who haven't been heard and want to be heard and aren't necessarily um, putting their words in verse but are certainly putting their hearts out there and, and their spirits out there and, and doing their best they can simply to survive. But that's, that's probably, I mean, it's in part a very, very violent book. Yeah. Uh, and I maybe wouldn't expect a college professor mm. from Colorado mm. uh, to be as explicitly sure. mega violent as it sometimes is, which even makes it more sort of, I don't know, influenced by hip hop, if you know what I mean, telling the truth. Yeah, I mean, I, I, hear, I hear exactly what you're saying. I, you know, and I think people can call it whatever they want. Mm. You know, I, I heard someone refer to it as ultra violence the other day, mega violence, you know, hey, it, it, it's up to you, but it is violent. <laughs> Violence happens, and I've learned the hard way that that violence happens. You know. I Tell me about that because I, I, you, you you mentioned it before that sure. you, you 
had a very violent experience when you were young. I was 17 years old. Yeah. I was standing in the back of my student council high school class. Yeah. And a lineman from the, the gridiron football team, uh, who happened to be tripping on acid at the time, <laughs> decided he wanted to play fight with me. I said no, and I turned. And he was already swinging his elbow at me. Ouch. And it connected in such a way that it tore my nose out of my face. It Literally. Didn't, it did not break the nasal bone. In fact, my Swedish surgeon, <laughs> who is completely responsible for the face you see today, We're he happened to be studying in Colorado. Um, you know, he said it was a one in a million break because it didn't break the nasal bone, but it tore out all the cartilage. Jeez. And it put my nose on the other side of my face. I had two facial reconstructive surgeries, and for about a year, I couldn't smell or taste because I had so mm. much nerve damage. And in an interesting way, I think, you know, not this not only helps me write pain from the inside out and empathize mm. in a very real way when I speak to someone who's been stabbed or shot or dealt with incredible violence or even committed yeah. terrible violence. You know, for, for me, again, I'm perfectly willing for, for people to put whatever label on it they like, but for me, it's realistic. Yeah. It's how it happens. But so is the best hip hop. <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm definitely not fighting against that. <laughs> uh, one of the big surprises uh, in, in the book, and now we, we talked about, we, we've both lived in London uh, during a couple of years of our lives. That's true. Suddenly, there's a mod, there's a skinhead in the book. Yeah, yeah. In Los Angeles. Yes. I was very surprised. Uh, ha happily surprised. He wakes up, he puts on his braces, Fred Perry shirts, he listens to the specials. Uh, puts on his boots. Is that like you? No. No? Because you got I mean, the good maybe boots. maybe a little. You, you I don't know. Good oh, why, thank you. That's very Well, I'm, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just curious. You know, it was interesting. I think one of the things that I definitely sought out when I was writing the book was the unexpected. Yeah, and this and was very unexpected. But, but that, uh, that includes the culturally unexpected as well. Yeah. Because I think, you know, I, obviously not everyone knows about it, but, but there's a very strong Latino audience that absolutely loves Morrissey. I know that. For example. There's even a Mexican... Say there's someone with a weird name who does Mexican versions of Morrissey songs. I read about this very recently. Okay, okay. So but, yeah, <laughs> I will okay, trust sorry. you. I will trust you uh, on this. There's also Morrissey karaoke night once a week in East LA. <laughs> Still to this day, you know. And I think I, I think I was always after again. Were you what's fun? unexpected? What's different? I was never much of a Smiths or, or Morrissey fan, but that's me. Um, found him a bit whiny. But he um, very whiny. That's, that's me. Thing. That's me. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, to all the Morrissey fans, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I happen to meet a guy who, who now happens to be quite a well-known tattoo artist in Southern California. And, you know, he grew up in a really rough neighborhood. He's Chicano. And the only thing he connected with was ska. And being a mod, and you know, and you know, cho you know, having a chopper, a little Vespa that he yeah. would ride around, and then he ended up Do you with call this them really. Choppers? He did. He did. That was, you know, wow. that was for that era. Let's making them cooler than they are. You think so? Yeah, <laughs> I think you're probably right. <laughs> Although, you know, he, the way he described it, it sounded pretty cool. The way they could modify it to the point where it could go very, very fast. Well, you can. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know. I, I think the thing that was fascinating about that was in an era when there was a tremendous amount of racial tension, he used art and music in particular yeah. as a way of connecting with some really diverse people. Yeah. I mean, there, there were some African-American guys in, in his group and, you know, they played music together and they did all, you know, all kinds of crazy things, mainly lots of drinking. Mm. Uh, but, it, you know, that, again, that's, that's always what I look for. It, it's, Los Angeles is always so much crazier than we think it is. You know, and, and, and just hearing that that was something he loved as yeah. a kid just sparked a character for me and sparked just a whole new idea for where to take the book. I mean, it was, it was really fun. No, I had really, uh, I had to go like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> but not in a bad way, right? Like, no, I don't no, no, trust this author. No, in a brilliant way. Okay, but but I, was, I was just very surprised. Good. Let's please hear Jenny read. Yeah. Jag kryper ihop till en boll och käken känns som om någon fräser den i en stekpanna. 
Jag sätter upp händerna och skyddar ansiktet, men det hjälper inte. Bollträt svingas om och om igen. Ett av slagen landar i nacken och hela kroppen domnar bort. En annan röst säger, knyt skiten medan han ligger platt så där. Jag kan knappt andas. Och en annan röst, kanske den första igen, stämmer in. Ja, gör det om du så jävla bra, Joker. En av dem heter Joker. Det måste jag komma ihåg, tror jag. Det är viktig information. Joker. Ordet fastnar i hjärnan och jag vrider och vänder på det. Jag känner inte till någon Joker förutom i serietidningarna. Och jag kan inte fatta varför de är ute efter mig. Och inte min bror som säkert har gjort någon idiotgrejen. Snälla, säger jag när jag kan andas igen. Som om det någonsin har funkat att böna och be inför de här monstren. Inte en chans. De är upptagna med att försöka rycka av med foten. Men jag är så bortdomnad att jag inte ens vet vilken. Nedanför mig sträcks benen nu. Där har du den, säger en av dem. När jag öppnar ögonen tänker jag, där har han vad? Runt omkring mig ser jag ett välkänt kvarter. En kort stund tror jag att jag har klarat mig när jag hör att de går iväg och ser bromsljusen på deras bil få garageportarna omkring mig och bli röda. Lättnaden sköljer över mig. De ger sig av, tänker jag. De ger sig av! Det är då jag ser en liten kille, kanske 12 år gammal, som gömmer sig vid promenaden. Hans ansikte blir rött i bromsljuset och jag ser, ja, han kollar på mig. Fast hans ögon är helt stora. Hans blick känns så skum att jag följer den ner för min kropp till fötterna. och Jag håller på att spy när jag ser att båda fotlederna är fastbundna bak i bilen med en rejäl vajer. Jag drar hårt men vajen lossnar inte. Den skär bara in i huden. Jag sparkar till med alla kraft jag har kvar men inget händer. Inget rör på sig. Jag kämpar för att komma ner med fingrarna. Bända bort den på något sätt. Men sen drar bilens motor igång. Och jag trycks platt och släpas med. Farten får huvudskålen och studsa fram över asfalten. Luften rusar över mig och det känns som om hela kroppen går upp i lågor när bilens bromsar nyper hårt. Farten jag har fått upp slungar mig framåt två, tre meter, fem. Jag måste ha studsat för jag flyger genom luften innan något hårt och kallt av typ metall smärsar in i ansiktet. Och den här gången känner jag hur kindbenet går sönder. Jag känner faktiskt inifrån hur det givika. Jag hör hur knaket ekar i öronen och hur benet bryts sönder och blod forsar in över tungan. Jag vrider på huvudet, öppnar munnen och släpper ut det. När jag hör att det träffar gatan och att det inte slutar droppa, då vet jag att det är över. Jag vet att jag är körd. Jag hade kanske en chans förut, men inte nu. En röst hörs från bilen, jag vet inte vem, så han ropar Få med i vajen och kolla så att den jäveln är riktigt död. En dörr öppnas, men jag hör inte att den stängs. Jag hör fotsteg komma närmare och sen tonar en mörk gestalt upp över mig och kollar om jag andas. Jag tänker inte ens, jag spottar så hårt jag kan. Den måste ha träffat för jag hör ett snabbt hasande och den mörka figuren drar sig bakåt. Shit, mannen, säger han. Jag fick hans blod i munnen. Försöker du ge mig AIDS eller? I det läget önskar jag faktiskt att jag hade AIDS så jag kunde ge det till folk. Jag försöker öppna ögonen lite till. Bara det högra öppnar sig. Jag ser hur den mörka figuren stoppar något i munnen. Och sen ser jag hur han hånler åt mig och visar tänderna. Sen är figuren ovanpå mig. Det går så fort att jag inte hinner fatta vad som händer. Men han slår mig hårt tre gånger i bröstet. Först känner jag inte kniven. Men jag märker på ljudet att han har den. På hur det får mig att tappa andan. Den går in djupt. Så djupt som en kniv kan gå. Hälsa din bror att vi tar honom snart. Viskar han. Som mamma viskar när hon är förbannad på en i kyrkan. Tyst argt. Tack. You um, you have to tell us about uh, HBO. We're gonna do a series, a film, hopefully, a or series. something, a series. series. 
uh, based on, on, on the work? How, how far is this? Uh, as far as I know, it's in pre-production. I don't. Yeah. I'm not privy to the intimate details of, of how it's moving forward, but uh, from what I understand, it's it's still moving, which is which is better than I can say for some of my other work that's been optioned. <laughs> <laughs> no, but ha ha having almost been on Skid Row mm. uh, a couple of <laughs> a couple of years back, yeah. and now. Not only you know traveling the world. Skid Row adjacent. Are, are, are you are you are you surprised by by the global uh, phenomena that yeah. this book has become? Yes, yes. Because it, I mean, it is about a very particular place. Yeah, uh, and time. I think I'm slowly starting to realize that, in a way, Los Angeles is a brand. That mm. it's you know because of television, because of film, because of music. Uh, uh, certain ideas are, are perpetuated, but also certain slices of the truth in Los Angeles slip, slip through as well. And I think, you know, because of the accessibility uh, of cinema in particular, I think yeah. it's, it's made a Los Angeles in our minds. And, 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 and this is true for just about anyone who's seen films set in the city, uh, whether Beverly Hills Cop or anything else, you know. So... I think that's been that's been humbling, but I, you know, if you'd told me, you know, even two three years ago that at some point I'd be sitting here with you and a bunch of people would actually come and listen to me <laughs> say something, I probably would have called you a liar. Uh, you know, it, it's it's I continue to be ridiculously impressed and and amazed. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's a great gift, and I just feel lucky to share it. But it is quite. I mean, when you when you read the book, you could. I at least could could quite easily see it being made into mm. a film or I, a or a series, especially for HBO, who did The Wire, oh. which I mean, your 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 book has been compared to to The Wire by some critics, which is <laughs> and and some you've obviously which watched, is shocking. You've obviously watched The Wire. Yes, of course. <laughs> but, you know, to be fair, many things are compared to The Wire and not. True. <laughs> you know, well, oh, you're right. this is not The Wire. By any sense, you know. So, so to have you know even someone like Dennis Lehane, who wrote on the wire, whom I've never met, ever, say something very, very kind, uh, you know, and you know, as far as he's yeah, concerned, very a blur true on your book. about the That's book. That's right. From you know that I, that I mean, it, it felt like a new life, you know, when I heard that. Like, wait, what? What just happened? He said, "What? That's that's not right." I mean, yeah, I, I was a denier initially. <laughs> uh, you know, it's um. It's amazing because, you know, I, I think I've watched The Wire a number of times. I'm, I'm consistently in awe of it. I tend to watch it in English with the subtitles on because I think it's just a master class in dialogue. Yeah. I'm always just so impressed. And I, I, also, I remember thinking... I mean, I mean I, my English is okay, but, oh, it's very watching, good but, what, but watching The Wire mm. with all the slang without subtitles sure. in English sure. for the hearing impaired. Uh, that was Difficult. Uh, d d impossible. You know, I, w I made my mother watch The Wire. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> she did not want to watch The Wire <laughs> at all. Uh, and we watched it with the subtitles on, but then we would talk about it after every episode. And, you know, I, it, I, we would have to pause quite frequently. What does that mean? Yeah. What does this mean? And then awkward conversations were had, you know, I about can, a number of I, uh, a number of I can terms imagine. There. Yes. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think you know it was it was one of perhaps my favorite you know experiences I've ever had with my mom. You know, the ability to just mm. sit and talk and explain and you know discuss how we felt about urban America and what mm. and what that meant. And obviously, it took on a very very different meaning for me when I moved to Los Angeles and and became part of that fabric. Uh, you know, I think. I, you know, I'm honored to hear you could, when you read it, you could very easily picture it, you know, mm. you know being a, a, a film, you know, that's, that's wonderful because I've always been, always a lover of cinema. You know, I, I'm consistently inspired by it and, and I, I really do make a genuine effort in my fiction to make it as visual as possible for, for the reader. Uh, even in some cases, it's quite uncomfortable, but in other cases, it's, it's really about putting you there allowing you to enter a, a dangerous place in the safest way possible, but hopefully just to change your perception of it and change how you feel about it, change what you think about it. 
Ryan Cassis, thank you very much. <laughs> would, you, would, would you mind reading ah, a bit in English? Yes. Just from, if that's all right. From the okay. for us. I saw I think, two notes. I mean, just a little thingy. And oh, sorry, I do this in Swedish. Om någon har några frågor, så när han har läst, så vill någon fråga något så räcker bara upp handen. Så uh, går det jättebra. This actually comes from uh, quite near the end of the book, uh, from the section, uh, Mikey's section. So the character we were speaking about, who uh, is is a bit of a mod, loves music. That that's his his gateway, his freedom. You know, his way to hopefully a different life, a better life. In L.A. It only means that things are different from the last time you could go out at night. And from now on, when we talk about these days, we'll talk about what they did to us. We'll talk about what we lost. And a wedge will get driven into the history of the city. On either side of it, there will be everything before and everything after. Because when you've seen enough bad things, it either breaks you for the world or it makes you into something else. Maybe something you can't know or understand right away, but it might just be a new you. Like when a seed gets planted, yet to be grown. Kerwin turns up the music and the chorus hits as the boulevard spools out beneath me with its yellow dotted line racing alongside before falling away into asphalt blackness. A warehouse next to the nearest burned apartment complex quickly blocks most of the Victorian from my view, and all I can see is the library window flickering orange like a winking jack-o'-lantern eye before we get too far down the road, and that light is gone too. All that's left to see of the house when then is where it's going skyward as a black tower forms above it. I'm hoping to see it better the farther away we get to understand more because maybe if I can see the rest of the neighborhood and how it burned, if I see how other people were targeted and suffered too, I can understand. But right now, all I can focus on is our house and how much it hurts to see it go. And how the distance doesn't give me any perspective. So I close my eyes. I put both my hands palm down on either wall of the truck's bed. And I hold tight to metal and chip paint as the rhythm of the street bumps me forward and back. Through the window behind me, I hear the song winding down. I hear it running into the wind, tangling with the whooshing sound of it. And I picture how things used to be. I see how the Victorian looked when I was 14, faintly blue in early morning light. I see underripe avocados in the grass, hard and green, the kind I used to pick and play soccer with. And beyond the tree that dropped them, I see one of the apartment blocks stands tall like a century, its roof only just going orange in the dawn. Something turns heavy in my chest when I imagine my own neighborhood, the one I grew up in, intact again. I see Ham Park's wooden handball wall still up, and kids playing on it, and grown men too, and the thumping sounds of their Saturday games echoed for blocks. And as far away as Momo's house, it just sounded like a heart beating. And maybe it was even the city's heart beating too fast in my head right now. Momo's house is whole again. His car is parked out front and he's walking to it with keys in his hand, nodding a hello at me as I go by on my chopper. And that's when it hits me. My memories are the only places I'll ever see any of it again. And I wonder if this is what writers are supposed to do. Rebuild places in their minds. Places long gone, places that disappear. And I wonder if that's true. Is it true of people who disappear too? A song is fading out now. I hear the girls' voices melt into the bass line as what's left of their harmony gives itself up to the wind and the grumble of the truck's engine for two good breaths. I don't hear anything but sirens far away. I don't hear anything but the truck worrying its axles. 
when a new song begins, a different kind, one with a loud drum beat, I don't recognize it. And it's a small thought that hits me then, but I feel it rumble and grow with each building whipping past, with each block. I feel myself agreeing with it. L.A. has an engine too, and it won't stop. It can't. It's a survivor. It will keep going no matter what, and it will push right through these flames and come out the other side of them as something broken and pretty and new. Yay. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. <laughs> Några frågor så är ni jättevälkomna. Så tar Ryan emot dem. Om inte så... Vi har en fråga här. Ja, men titta. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for, for a beautiful reading and sharing your thoughts on L.A. and the riots and memories of violence. No. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. Uh, I just wonder, uh, how do you get into the rhythm? The, the, how do you start up your writing? What's sure. your routine? Sure. I get up really early in the morning. I mean, darkness early in the morning. Um, my wife makes fun of me. Uh, I get up at 3.30 in the morning. Um, but I do that for a really particular reason. I love the laughs. I totally hear it. I live in the port. So it's when the ships come in and the, the horns go. And it, I don't know, it's just, it's just a magical time. Uh, to, to be awake and, and to feel like it's my time of the day. You know, you're not alone because the ships are coming in and you can hear that there are other humans out there in the darkness. But in my space, I'm alone. I'm not bothered uh, unless the cats are being completely ridiculous, which they are wont to do from time to time. You know, and, and what I try to do, I think, every day is I seek a chapter but I definitely don't always write a chapter, you know, but, I, but I'll, I need to have a rough idea of where it starts and a, a plot point, but I don't always know where it ends. Um, but it needs to end with a question, a hook a, of some kind that's going to push, that's going to give me a boost the next day. Uh, so, you know, in a very uh, simplistic way, that, that's all I try to do. And beyond that, you know, I, I just try to be consistent, you know, because more than anything, I think that's, If there is a secret, that's the big one. Just be consistent, be writing. And, you know, over time, you know, I can, I can honestly say, you know, certainly as someone who, you know, wh whose career was completely obliterated uh, by writing a long book for eight years, uh, there's, there's really something to be said for, you know, potentially having someone to bounce it off of. You know, and, and, and for me, it's, it's my wife. You know, she has... Uh, prosecutorial experience. She worked in the DA's office. Like, none of this scares her. She's completely familiar with all of it. Uh, and she's a very sane, clear voice. Uh, and, and it's helpful. And, and, you know, she actually tasked me with um, what sounded like the worst thing ever uh, when I started writing this book. She said, you know, I'm not exactly for you writing this book, but I don't care what you write. You have to read it to me every day. It could be a sentence, it could be two words, but I had to read it to her, and honestly, like that gave me this, this boost of, ah, it's gotta be good. It's gotta be good before I read it to her because I respect her time. Yeah, I didn't wanna make her hear something that, that wasn't any good, but in a really wonderful way, that became the engine of, I think, the rhythm and the voice, you know, and, and kind of pushing it forward, but also doing my best to find different rhythms because there are 17 different you know, first-person characters in the book, and it, it doesn't work if it's a monotone, if everyone sounds similar. Uh, so that's a very long answer to your <laughs> wonderfully brief question. <laughs> Thank you. This thing of getting up at 3.30 in the morning, is that, I mean, I sometimes read somewhere. Four. Sometimes Sometimes four, that's good, <laughs> that's a sleep in. Uh, yeah. I just read somewhere that, that uh, you come from a long line of militaries. I do, yeah, yeah, Air Force. Air Force. Uh, my dad was a captain. My grandfather yeah. was a colonel. Uh, my grandfather was in the Army Air Corps before there was even an Air Force. Yeah, I was born on Scott Air Base in Illinois. Uh, and, you know, when before I was a year old, 
roughly. My dad's right here. Ah! <laughs> Captain Gaddis right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, before I was even a year old, we'd moved to Colorado Springs where the U.S. military uh, Air Force Academy is. Basically bought a house on a hill and, you know, roughly been told, well, that's where you're going. And, uh, and honestly, I was going there. Yeah. You know, I had done everything. I was top of my class. I was a uh, soccer scholar athlete. You know, I was, I was doing really well. I'd done all the, uh, you know, the other things. And then I got hit. And it changed my life. You know, it changed my face. It changed my life. It changed how I felt about being human. And more than anything, it meant I needed to heal. And, and one yeah. of the ways I healed, probably the primary and most important way I healed was through art. Because I didn't go out. You know, my, my head was packed with gauze or, you know, I, my stitches weren't healed yet or any number of things were happening. So I would watch a lot of movies and read a lot of books. And that was how I interfaced with the world. And that really changed completely my direction in life in a good way yes i've no regrets we're all very thankful for that. <laughs> all right sorry uh, ryan um i know that uh, you have a very specific story about how you got to know all these people in the gangs and i know that you can't say so much about these things but i think it would be interesting for a lot of people here to hear mm how you got into that world and, and got so connected that you could tell all these characters in mm. such a wonderful and distinct way. <laughs> this is my publisher, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> he's a wonderful man and I know what he's fishing for. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, what's worth saying is that for three or four months, I really just spoke to anybody and everybody. I was, I was working with Ugler. I basically did something called running interference. Uh, so that meant I would go to walls wherever they were in the city. It could be Lincoln Heights, it could be City Terrace, it could be Linwood, it could be anywhere. And we most frequently worked in poorer neighborhoods that really needed art. They needed more art, they needed a better sense of community, they needed things to talk about, things to connect over. So, forgive my sniffle. Uh, it, you know, that worked fine. You know, I, I, met, I, I met a lot of people. I, I heard a tremendous amount of slang and argo, and I, and I started getting, you know, the rhythms of, of particular speech, you know, through that. And a number of those folks I just kept in touch with, and they turned out to be former gang members. Nobody tells you that right away. That's just not something you do. Oh, by the way, you know, I did this back in the day. Um, and it started there, and it started in a very informal way. I was mainly just curious. I didn't know I was writing a book. I, I just wanted to know, because I was, you know, I came from a very different upbringing, and I was, I, I just wanted to listen. And I think there's something very special. There's a transmission that happens in listening where, you, you know, if you listen well, and you listen hard, and you listen with respect, the other person feels seen. You know, they feel like, wow. You know, this, this person actually get, you know, got what I was trying to get across. And, you know, that's, that's vital, I think, to, to being a writer, period. You know, if you can't listen, you know, certainly within fiction, you know, wh why, why do you do it? But, you know, th this actually led to something quite dangerous for me uh, because I'd been speaking to a number of lower-level former gang members for three or four months, maybe a little more, I don't remember. And I got a call. Uh, one day, and I was summoned. That was actually the word that was used. I was summoned uh, to Linwood. And it was basically a test. You know, hey, is this, is this white boy even going to show up? Come to Linwood. Come alone. I went. I took the bus, the 760. I didn't own a car. Couldn't afford a car. Uh, I took the bus, I took the train everywhere, and this was actually, it's one of the secrets, actually, I've never actually even said this, because it never comes up, it's one of the secrets of why I connected with people, because I was connecting with people in poorer communities, and I actually knew bus routes, I knew train routes, <laughs> uh, we traveled literally in the same circles, uh, and that helped tremendously, that really helped ease people's worries about me, I think, in, a, in kind of a fundamental way, uh, so... I, I, you know, I went to Linwood, and, and I completely... I, I lived in East London when it wasn't so wonderful or lovely. Uh, uh, and I had my, <laughs> my real phone in my sock and a fake phone in my pocket, you know, in case anyone wanted to rob me. 
And yet I had been told, you know, be, be, you have to be 100% honest no matter what. That was a directive of actually going to this meeting. I got to Linwood. I, I walked in. Uh, you know, I had dressed terribly uh, because I thought I didn't want to make myself a target. And then I walked into what actually was quite a nice restaurant and felt immediately out of my depth and like I was being an idiot. But this, this continued because um, there was a guy by the door he just kind of nodded up at me like he'd been waiting for me, and he kind of guided me through this restaurant. And, you know, Spanish everywhere, just, just bouncing off the walls, and families are there, and, and, and couples, and, and it's this amazing, lively place. And we walk through that, and then there's this incredibly wide moat, just an empty chunk of floor, and then there's one table in the very, very, very back. And I get told to sit there. So I do, and another gentleman comes up and he sits down and he just holds his hand out to me. It's his phone. <laughs> and, then, and then I have to decide, of course, fake phone, <laughs> real phone. And I, of course it was real phone because I had to be 100% honest. I was told it would keep me safe. So I just start reaching for it and he starts laughing. He says, that's the first place they'd look. <laughs> So, so again, this, this, this feeling of being an idiot, uh, you know, it just, ke- just keeps going. Uh, so, you know, it, that was really the start of, of meeting with this guy. He grilled the hell out of me. You know, where was I from? What did I do? What did I want? You know, I, I was a writer, but I hadn't written anything in a really long time. Like, he had done his homework on me because obviously he'd spoken to everyone who'd spoken to me, but also Google exists, and he had Googled me, and he knew I hadn't published a book in a really long time, and he threw it in my face. He wanted to see how I would re- react to it. And, I, you know, that was very difficult. I basically could have told him all the lies I'd been telling myself, but I just simply said, it wasn't good enough. And I remember him blinking. Like, I remember that kind of hitting him. Like, oh, damn. Like, wow, okay. It went from there. You know, I think the, the, the really one of the pivotal moments and this might be what you're pushing me toward. I, I wanted to write Payasa, a female gang member. And he and a number of other folks, you know, who had been very involved uh, in that gang life in 92 said, no, hmm. you can't. Women weren't involved the way you think they were involved. And, you know, this, this was difficult for me because I have a, a very good friend who's in some ways been, you know, like a big sister to me and, like, it's not a secret, but it's not something she ever tells anyone. You know, she has multiple master's degrees now. She has an incredible job. You know, she has a way of presenting herself in a way that no one would ever know where she comes from, but she grew up in a gang. And that was always, you know, because of what I'd been through, again, you know, with, with my nose, you know, that connected us. And, and so I didn't, I didn't necessarily tell him, look, you know, I kind of have a sense of how a woman might grow up in a gang and how this works. You know, instead, I was just so worried and, and so upset that I would somehow be disrespectful you know, with my characterization. And it was, that was really, when I wrote that, that's when the idea of the riots coming in changed everything. Because I thought, if, if there's a moment that gives her the freedom to do what I need her to do as a fictional character, then I need to do that. And I was terrified because the riots would mean a tremendous amount of research, but I just dove in because it was worth it to tell her story, do her voice, and it was this wonderful relief to write it. And so I was petrified when I was called back to Linwood and told, you know, okay. Uh, so I heard, I heard you wrote that girl. I said, yeah, I did. He said, so tell me the story then. Just deadpan, you know, sitting back, arms crossed, like the most closed body language you could possibly imagine. And I just said, wow, you know, if there's ever a tougher, a tougher audience to, you know, pitch something to, I don't know it. So I just, I told him her, her story as I had it in my head, beat by beat. This happens, this happens, this happens. She reacts this way, she does this, we move to. And the amazing thing was the, the instantaneous response I was getting from him, which was that his body language was breaking down. He was literally becoming more open to me. He was no longer holding his arms crossed. He was no longer kind of doing this. He was leaning forward, 
who's listening. And we got to the end, and, you know, it, it's really one of the most Wild West <laughs> sequences in the book, you know, her, the end of her, her section. And I just said, yeah, and then they, she goes over here, and they do this, and then this happens, and moves over here. And by then, he's so into the story that he stops me, and he says, um, if you want to kill somebody and get away with it, you don't do it like that. <laughs> And he takes the hot sauce and he moves it to the middle of the table. <laughs> he takes the pepper and he takes the salt. And he explains to me that these are my characters that I've just described to him. And he proceeds to move them in a way that would be like the most feasible honor killing and how to get away with it. And that was one of the, I think, craziest moments I've ever experienced in my life. I was sweating. Like, the hair on the back of my neck was standing straight up. You know, I couldn't ever take notes. I couldn't ever, you know, whatever I had in my head was what I could take out of any of these situations. You know, just phone was never on me. They would take it away from me. Uh, And this was, oddly, this was, you know, a good... It was a number of months before the NSA released, or that information was released about the NSA being able to record you even when you think your phone is off. I, it was a little, it was, it was scary. It was really scary stuff. But I just remember that, that feeling of, of, you know, r- rushing out of there and, and just trying to remember it, trying to, you know, trying to remember everything. It's like, oh, how do I grab this? How do I grab this? I feel like something's slipping away. And, and I think in many ways... You know that might have contributed to to the voices and 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 the um, the pace, the the frenzy of the book. I mean, I, I wonder if it came from this. Oh, I have to remember this. I have to remember how you know it was to be told something like this. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I just breathed wide into the microphone in a very graceful way. <laughs> Are you happy, sir? <laughs> okay. Thumbs up. Oh, and on that <laughs> note, thank you very much. It's been a treat. Cheers. Cheers, Anderson. <laughs> Ryan, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, I'm happy you remembered it as well as you did. We will remember this for sure. <laughs> um, we would like to give you a small bag with... David Isak on it. It's okay. Instead of a gift, we have donated a small sum to the fund. This is a journalist, Swedish journalist, who for more than 14 years now has been in prison in Eritrea without a trial or wow. any charges. So thank wow. you very much for thank being you. here tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Anders. Thank you, Anders. Thank you, Anders. And now I thought I'd do a little melodikryss over gång. Because as you heard, so Ryans pappa, flygkapten på flygbas, Ryan växte upp där. Dead.